Anyway, so let's get right into it. Oh. Hi, I'm Ollie from MovieWeb, and today I'm joined by filmmaker David A. Roberts to discuss his new film, Older Gods. How are you today, David? Um, not so bad. How are you doing? Yeah, yeah. Not so bad, like I just discussed with yourself. Uh, awesome. But before we get into the uh, into the interview, uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about Older Gods, like the plot and where people can check this out? Okay, so Older Gods is a bit of a... Uh, psychological cosmic horror, which um, sounds like a, a long-winded way of saying it's a bit Lovecraftian. It's a bit um, a bit of a slow burn built around mystery rather than kind of jump scares all the way through. But what essentially it is is uh, a story of a man called Chris who travels to the remote Welsh countryside um, to dis- to investigate the the story of his missing friend and. Through various means, he ends up finding out that there was some kind of apocalyptic cult and something happened, and the whole film is basically him trying to investigate and work out what happened, um, and but also kind of going down this little descent of madness of his own to see what's real and what's not. Um, it's out at the moment. It's, uh, it's on Amazon Prime, it's on Apple TV, it's on Tubi. Uh, it's pretty much on any good VOD type thing, but it's also in a... Uh, it's been in the film, still in the film festival run for about a year now. So anything, uh, I think we've got a couple more coming up, I think, but we're about to find out if it's going to be in a couple more. So um, uh, you can see it in some cinemas coming up as well. Well, congratulations on that uh, year long film festival yeah. run. And yeah, I, I really encourage people to go check this movie out, as you just said, Lovecrafty. And if you love that sort of film, this is the movie for you. Let's jump straight in. Older Gods was Older Gods was shot during COVID, mm-hmm. and it was with a crew of just seven people. Is that is that correct? I think seven while we were there. I think we argued that there was eight people went into post production, but it was, but yeah, it was it was. Um, we were all good to go for uh, a much bigger budget film, um, and then as soon as you, you've been working for years to get to a point, and then all of a sudden there's some kind of worldwide pandemic. Hasn't happened in my lifetime until I'm just about to do my debut film. Um, and then uh, what was quite inspiring with the get, because I was a bit miserable about it and we don't, we all didn't know when the world has come back to normalcy. You have no idea. So cool with the guys, because um, I'm one of the um, producers at Wagyu Films who were producing the film. So the other guys, we were all kind of like, well, we can still do something. We've still got the heads of the departments. We've still got a bit of budget left. It's like, what can we do? So rather than waiting for permission, shall we say, we just worked out a story that we could do if we were keeping it smaller, just a couple of people. Um, but obviously, you can count, you kind of got to keep in mind the the whole COVID thing as well. So we needed something at a strange remote location that uh, the funny thing is that all of the crew actually stayed on that creepy little cottage in the middle of nowhere. So, uh, but which was actually, it wasn't, it was actually quite pleasant actually, because it was like one of the, the hottest weeks of the year. Um, but yeah, so it's one of those, it was kind of from necessity, uh, not because from not just budgets and things, there's more, because of COVID, we all had to kind of do a little bubble in a way, but we also really liked that location and there wasn't any hotels for miles, you know, so it's kind of, we had to have enough people that we could juggle eight or nine different jobs each. Uh, and uh, I think we were there for a week and then we did another week or so of filming uh, for the kind of like the woods and flashbacks and things like that afterwards. So yeah, about seven people got the, <laughs> made, got that thing to the finishing line, so to speak. Well, that that is mighty impressive, because watching the film, it feels like it is much more of a, a bigger production, at least, oh, uh, in terms of what, what I thought. Um, how was it working dur- during COVID? As you said, uh, you had to have people isolating, which obviously everybody had to. But how was it when you got down to the brass tacks of, of shooting the movie? How, how was that experience for you? It was actually... When we were there and we had everything, um, it was actually quite great because it was kind of, as long as we knew everybody here was safe because we were miles from anywhere else. Um, so you could kind of focus on it. There was no internet, so you couldn't be checking phones or anything. It, it was no, it was miles to the nearest place to pop out and get something. So um, it was actually quite you know, everybody could focus on it. Everybody, um, you couldn't, nobody could have 
nobody on this small crew was going to sit around and it was just kind of a job because a lot for a lot of people on the crew um it was their first feature they'd done lots of shorts and commercials and and so everybody really uh dug in and so it, it was kind of a especially halfway through the week it becomes kind of some kind of a weird summer camp you know where everybody's kind of away from home and lost no internet can't contact everybody so it was actually kind of great in a way um and you didn't notice that even we were filming for like 14 hours a day it would just go like that and you wouldn't really notice and because the week was flying by the only time it became a problem was things like we got a load of uh uh costumes and one like he's just got a simple white shirt and when we pulled it out of the bag I'd not why we just had one on that day, I don't know. But when we pulled it out of the bag, it, it was uh, a short sleeved one shirt when it said long sleeved on the back. Uh and he'd already filmed with a long sleeve, so we couldn't do it. So then it became Scott, one of the producers. I think he went on a six mile, a six hour drive just to find a white uh shirt. <laughs> so then that was it. So so it was kind of yin and yang of great away from everybody, can't be disturbed, everybody's safe. Um, because ironically, we could say that we were safer there than we were back in the city, you know. Um, but also if you needed something or if we forgot something, um, all of our fancy uh production schedule software was on the was uh online based, we've noticed day one, which we should have really noticed on a location scout. Um, but so then day two was printing off pages and pages and pages of things. So it was kind of, it, it made you just go a bit more old school, you know, in terms of you couldn't rely on things on the internet and your phone. It was just more us together, remembering what to do, cut off from the rest of the world. Um, but it was great. It was, it was the hardest thing I've ever done, probably. Um, but when you, when you look back, you don't look back at it in terms of the hard part of it. You just look back at it as that was something that I'd like to do again, you know? Yeah, well, yeah, COVID gave you that that great opportunity, yeah. and um, the film shows that uh, passion just outweighs everything. At least it yeah. did to me. No matter how big or how small your budget or crew is, the passion that everybody has involved on the project, no matter what, it will turn out into a great, passionate project. And I really admire that about it, and that's what I love so much about Older Gods. I think so because if you, I mean, I think that sometimes not putting anybody else down, but sometimes on big budget jobs, you could say that a lot of those jobs are just a job, you know, like a job between, and to be fair, we've, we're we crew, we've worked for crew with other people and you kind of go from job to job, don't you? But the good thing about this one, it was, this was our one, this was going to be everybody's calling card, so to speak. Obviously it's my debut directing, but the director of the photography, Sean, it's his first feature, it's... Um, uh Andy our kind of he, he, our art director who did lots of the kind of uh, prosthetics and things like that it was his first thing to show off what what he could do to get other jobs in the future if it's not with us um so everybody there was kind of that's the thing as you say pa passion Trump passion and a bit of creativity um will get will always get you you'll noticeable something a bit better rather than if you just throw money at a problem often it doesn't come across as most creative, does it? It just comes across as they were just trying to get it done, you know, which you can't argue with, to be fair. And I'd probably say if we had a lot more money, I would have thrown some money at some problems to get to, try to get over some hurdles. But I like the way that if there was a problem, we'd work it out together. You know, so if there's something we can't do, we've got no other options to go anywhere and get that thing. So let's sit down, let's work it out. Do we change the story slightly? Do we use a different part of the location? Do we... And that was part of the fun, really. Um, and I really learned that. Apart from I've done loads of commercials and short films and things like that, but um, everybody kind of says directing is just decision, quick decision making. You know, you kind of know everybody's job, and it's just every you got. Even though there's only seven people there, but I've still got seven people asking me different questions at the same time. So it's just making the decision, checking with everybody else. Is that something we all agree with? That everything's fine. And then getting on with it, and but we had no, there was no negativity there or anything like that. It was all right. Let's do it. Let's get up and go. And that was great. That was the that was the fun of making the film, really. Yeah. Well, movies are they're their art. There's no denying that they're art, yeah. and that comes with creativity and, and passion, as with any. And again, no matter how big how big your budget is or how low your budget, as long as that shines through, then that's all that really matters. Yeah. Now definitely. you said earlier that 
older gods you had an idea for older gods before covid hit i was curious as to what that movie would look like so i think um it was more on the lines of um it's not really a spoiler or anything but more obviously with this this guy called chris coming to investigate what happened to his friend the original story was kind of what happened to his what billy's journey was where he was part of some organization that researches these sites that they call them where um the signs of <laughs> people up to no good um but he goes to investigate so it was more on the lines of that it was more kind of a team goes out, investigates, they all start getting hunted one by one type thing, which is, is a cool story. And, it, you know, you never know. Maybe in the future you could do something similar. Um, maybe one day we can get a prequel. Maybe. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I, don't, I have to talk to Yai and the, uh, the actor who played Billy. Um, but, it's, um, but it was more on that line. So it was a bit more, uh, not country spanning, but because he he kind of follows this trail all the way to this um cottage in the middle of nowhere in Wales. So it was more kind of that story. So when it came down to right, we've got a few months to come up with the story, find a location. We just let because that budget that we had left from the original one was it, it wasn't going to be there forever. It was just going to burn. So we had to act on it quick. So my initial thinking was that story could be uh okay what if what happened afterwards you know where somebody was invested is like if <laughs> you're starting with the sequel in a way to come back and work out what had happened to his mate um i thought that was quite interesting and then obviously it comes to the practical sides of it as well with not a lot of actors not a lot of locations not a lot of um things needed so it kind of ticked all the box boxes in a way yeah yeah well that, i really enjoyed that aspect about it i think just the idea of investigating and having some secret sort of us as humans have this innate interest in it. We want to know what happened. Why is this, why is this going on? So yeah. I really enjoyed the aspect to it. And of course the isolation of the cottage, I, it's terrifying when you're isolated from everything and everyone around you. So that immediately <laughs> created a fear for me anyway. Um, anyway oh, it's the, gods... it's, it's all, so I was, gonna, I was just going to say that I saw somebody explain the, uh, a, just a definition of cosmic horror. It was just fear of the unknown which I think is, to me, much more scarier than, um, you know, if, it, if it's a, you know, a horror with a psycho, it's like, well, you could, out if you've got some decent trainers, you can outrun the psycho maybe. But with zombies, you can just walk slightly faster. than It's more, you might have a chance, but if it's something that is out there and you don't know what the danger is and you can't really put your finger on it and you don't know which direction it's going to come from, that kind of scares the shit out of me a lot more than knowing somebody's running towards me, you know, if that if that kind of makes sense. Oh, no, no, I completely understand. Some of my favourite horror movies are ones that you don't know what the evil is and my mind plays tricks on me thinking, yeah. oh, it's, e it's more evil than it actually is. <laughs> but that's just, that's just, but yeah. I, I do get what you mean by that. Um, Older Gods is a Lovecraftian horror movie at its core, and I was wondering if you have any favourite uh, Lovecraftian tales or movies or TV shows or video games. So, yeah, it's it's not... I have had a few people, I have heard people go, this is not Lovecraft enough. It was just like, well, because it's more, it's Lovecraft inspired, like all cosmic horror, you know, any kind of, anything which is dealing with the grand scale of the universe and everything like that, it all kind of um, comes from him. Um, but uh, there's a few, I'm not actually a huge fan of the books per se. It's more kind of, it's more like the concepts he comes up with, I think like, but... Obviously, Call of Cthulhu is the obvious one, which is kind of his greatest hit type thing. Um, I enjoy little things like, like as a, the lurking fear, but the mountains of badness, probably. I think just the fact that it's, um, uh, I like the spiral into Matt. It's always a journey somewhere. And um, the, the huge, the big part of our Lovecraftian, most Lovecraft stories is usually the hearing of some myth. Um, uh, and then going to investigate it and then finding something that they don't understand. So that was that's the part that we've kind of inspired by, so to speak. But um, Innsmouth's a good one, Shadow over Innsmouth. In Innsmouth? Innsmouth? And uh, The Lurking Fear, I quite like, which is not really monsters and things. It's more just a creepiness. But it's really great. It's really great. I'd really recommend... Actually, I'd really recommend, if anybody likes Older Gods, there is actually uh, on if you listen to audiobooks, there's 
something like the the all all of Lovecraft's tales as narrated by Jonathan Keeble, who plays the Watcher in Older Gods, the guy, the voice that you hear, and which is a strange coincidence because um, I'd heard him on other. I, I I heard of him via like you always hear he creeped up in video games and um, uh, a lot of audio books because I tend to read when I'm uh, driving, so to speak. So I did listen to a lot of them. Uh, and he just had this brilliant voice. And it's still strange that when we were talking for the first time, as he was recording his lines, he was telling us how he's just finished recording this Lovecraft audiobook. And that's how that's why I really, I get no partnership or percentage of that, but, I, <laughs> but I'd really recommend that because he's such a good narrator where I'm very thickeny with the, you know, like if I'll listen to audiobooks if the narrator is really good. And I've, but I've, I don't know if you've ever had a really terrible. Sto- like a really good book with a terrible narrator, it just ruins it for me. So uh, I'd recommend that. And half the ones he talks to is really great. But that's but Mountains of Madness. That's the biggest one for me. Uh, and Dagon was quite a good one as well. If you've ever read Dagon, which is kind of the like the sea comes up from the bottom and there's a huge sea monster. That, um, it's, but that's the concepts because obviously it was written in the twenties and. I know Lovecraft himself was a very questionable guy, uh, which, um, <laughs> shall we say? Um, but I think that does that make if you separate the art from the person, it's kind of like the concepts he came up with were very unique, new, strange. And that's big for me now. Anything which is just a bit weirder and a bit stranger rather than just by the numbers horror type thing. Um, so I'll still give him a read every now and again. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Do you have any favorite? Um movies that are in the Lovecraftian subgenre, like they're not directly inspired by Lovecraft, but well, ripped um, from a book. Well, Lovecraftian or actually love uh well I I'm I, I like um what they call Benson and Moorhead's films. I think they've they're not Lovecraft, but they're very cosmic horror Lovecraftian, you could argue with some of them. Um the Colour Out of Space with Nicolas Cage in it was actually surprisingly good. I thought that was going to be like a strange B movie, but that actually was great. Um, but I, I, I think that's the thing with actual, unless you're big fans of like the reanimator and the gut from beyond type ones, uh, there isn't a lot of great Lovecraft films out there, really. But to me, the the good Lovecraftian films are things like The Thing. You know, The Thing is one of my favorite films. And and if we were uh, to say inspired by the thing in a way, it's more again, it's more again in that film. What's creepier to me is they're them not knowing who's the thing, rather than the moments with the big creepy monsters. And obviously, there's some fucking awesome scare jumps, like when he puts his fist to the chest and all that. But it's more what's creepy to me is the the scenes where they're all just looking at each other. The, the blood scene where they're all kind of not sure. Uh, so that's the suspension of it. So it's more, yeah, so you can say that there's not a great lot of Lovecraft films, but there's a million really well um, Lovecraftian inspired films like The Thing, Prince of Darkness by um, uh, The Void is great. Have you ever seen The Void? Uh, uh, yes, yes, I, I, I love The Void. It's one, one kind of my favourites, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I love The Void. It's it's very much one of, it's kind of the opposite of all the gods in a way, because that is all awesome prosthetics and monsters, <laughs> yeah. and stuff, uh, which is which I love too. Um, so I suppose it could be kind of a dual feature, because a lot of people, we've been compared with The Void a lot in a lot of reviews and things, which is fine with me. But I think if you're fans of The Void, it it's not parallel you know it's ours is more of a mystery and i think and a slow burn where theirs is an awesome 100 miles an hour uh thing heads exploding type thing which i love too but it's kind of do you see what i mean there's varieties of yeah. type of lovecraftian type films out there really yeah no i i absolutely adore the void when i first yeah. checked it out i was like okay well, what's this going to be about and i was just my mind was blown by the end of it it was 100 <laughs> miles an hour it doesn't doesn't relent all the crazy prosthetics was like What's what's going well, it, on? It, well, well, I it had sta- a fantastic time. It starts. It kind of starts as like a John Carpenter siege type film in a hospital, doesn't it? And then yeah. it's like this descent into hell where they go into the basements and there's all these things. But it's not really a spoiler. Just watch it. If 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 you yeah, good. well, every everyone should check it out, regardless. So yeah. But that's clearly inspired by Lovecraft, The Thing, definitely uh, Prince of Darkness. Um, 
but yeah, so th- that they're the kind of the Lovecraft inspired films, uh, very much so. I'm not sure there's a lot of actually love. I'm not a huge fan of Go Be- From Beyond and Reanimate and all that, which are the first ones that come to me with the actual Lovecraft film. But that Color Out of Space with Nicolas Cage is pretty good. Yeah, I've still yet to check that one out, but I've heard that's that's really good Color Out of Space. So that's it's that's good. the next it, on my watch list. Again, the tone and a bit weird and. Uh, it goes it goes in a bit of a turn at the ends, which might not be it for everybody, but it's it's um I, I liked it. It was good. It's different. If it's that's part of my thing where you, how many times you watch a film and you're just kind of like, Yeah, that was fine. Yeah, that was great. Yeah, okay. And then you just never talk about it again and then you forget about it. If it's something which is just a bit different, a bit weird, a bit unique, a bit strange, and it might not be your favorite film in the world, but you go away wanting to talk about it or maybe it even better having the sense that I kind of need to watch that again to see if there's any uh any bits I missed or was there any little easter eggs of what happened or I need to watch it just to kind of get the story exactly or happen or let's, let's work out the ending as any clues to the strange ending they're my favorite films at the moment and that's and obviously what we're trying to get into older gods as well because you know especially if somebody's into big budget horror and things like that it's more you could try the smaller one, which is a bit strange, a bit different. Um, but it might be up your alley, you know. So that that's the that's kind of what we were aiming for, should we say? Yeah, yeah. Being be a film critic, I've seen loads of just yeah, it was fine. Yeah, Never you must about have. it again. But the movies that just blow my mind and just flip a switch, I just I, I need to talk to someone about it. I need, <laughs> but the thing is, nobody I know really has much of the same taste as weirdness <laughs> as I do, so it's quite yeah. difficult. <laughs> Um, that's why you anyway, go online enough. and you start talking to other yeah. strange people online to get to get your feedback. Oh yeah, that <laughs> yeah, that tends to work, especially on on X now and Threads. It yeah, tends yeah, to yeah. be be where I'm where I'm most uh, at anyway. Uh, what was it that initially inspired you to pursue a career in the film industry? Um, it was even as a little um, kid, I was writing stories. It was I just remember I wasn't the best in school, should we say? But um, um, or the best it behaved in school. It was more the kind of, uh, but when it came to stories, I was always fascinated. So if it was something that, um, do you know, you're kind of bored of this, bored of this, but I need mean, just focus on something. So if somebody's telling a story that I'm interested in, that's all I wanted to hear. So as you kind of grew up, you were kind of worked out what we were doing and you're not sure what you're going to do. And they always ask you what you, um, what are you going to do for the rest of your life at like 16 or something when you don't even know how to spell your own name properly? Uh, it's 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 kind of, uh, it was kind of not fell into it, but it's just kind of once you go out of school, got me, it's, and then it becomes about who you surround yourself with, wasn't it? It was just me and my friends always talked about film. And, um, and when it came to, uh, I mean, in the future, I'll make all kinds of uh, genres of film, but horror always came down to, uh, it's just one that fascinated me. And ironically, if you ask any horror filmmaker, even though they're making darker stuff and creepier stuff, it's usually more fun than drama, you know, in terms of because it's going through a lot. And, they, and obviously we have scenes of that. But halfway through, it, it's just more fun to make. <laughs> and, um, and, uh, and there's little clues as I was growing up in terms of like uh, my parents would say, even as a little kid, I'd be watching scary film or everybody else would be terrified and I'd be sat a a couple of feet away from the TV cross-legged fascinated apparently I would cover my ears so I was scared of the sound but I wasn't fussed about what was happening on screen um and then what in and then really kind of but Kate obviously got serious once we went into university because that's where we met Sean Bishop our uh, director of photography met Keith Lupton our production designer met uh, Scott Bishop, who's Sean's brother. Um, so it, it came to a point where you surround yourself with people who all want the same thing. That's when you realize, well, we could actually do this. So it, a lot of people ask it you know, as like advice or filmmakers, how would you get started and things like that? And it's not about, oh, I need to go to Hollywood and try and pitch an idea to this, that, and the other. It's surround yourself with passionate people about film too, who all have a different specialism, you know? So and even make each other's films, you know, or I'll help you with being a, a cameraman if you help edit my thing or something like that. And that's kind of what we did until we all kind of realized that um, we all had our specific things. So that's when we started Wagyu Films. 
Um, and we started just doing commercials, so to speak, to try and pay the bills. And the plan, but the plan was to kind of just do feature films eventually, but growing slowly but surely, doing things like commercials and all that. That does then essentially help us grow a team and have an office and have all the gear and have all the production heads. So instantly our um, budget costs are slashed in half, especially for investors who usually have got to pay for renting of every little thing. Um, we get to the point where it's pretty much all you, we have to pay for is um, actors and locations, and that's how we're able to pretty much do all the gods, really. Well, that, that was a fascinating answer. That, amen, <laughs> brother. <laughs> uh, like you said, you've done a lot of um, commercials and short films, and this is your first feature film for yourself and for everyone involved. And I just wondered what the difference is in uh, filming a short film, commercial, and feature film was for you. Um, so the feature film itself compared to the, uh, short films, the narrative short, like commercials are very, you just got to make them look pretty and they've got to have a point, you know, it's like, what's the point of this, what you're trying to get across it usually in like a two or th 30 seconds to three minutes. So it's more about the pre-production of that. It's like coming up with the idea and kind of how can we do it? Short films. There's not a lot of difference um, between the film, into, apart from they're just more intense with the feature film. Um, but the, the problem with short films is they don't kind of, well, uh, well the, the advantage of short films is you kind of really don't need a beginning, middle and end. If you ever watch a short film, it could just be a beginning or it could just be an end. or it could just You don't have to kind of finish a thought. You could just cut it off. Um, so the biggest problem to me was in filming... You have to, because you film everything out of sequence, even when we're trying to do things in terms of, because we're all in the same location, wouldn't it be great to film it all in sequence? But you just can't because you've only got X amount of time. So we need to do some night shoots, you know, like uh, uh, we also need to plan for when the sun's this side of the building to when it's that side. So the shadows aren't all strange and different. Uh, um, so... I had to have in my head, I need to understand. Working with Rory, the actor, who did a great job. He needs to remember, he needs to know the levels of, he starts off all just, you know, confused and wondering what's going on. So how terrified is he? Because we always laugh how he starts off with a nice pretty haircut and a shirt and tie and end of the film, he's just covered in shit, half naked. <laughs> uh, so it's kind of um, working out that journey and remembering where you're up to. Does that make sense in terms of that's that's the trickiest part of even though especially when because of the middle of nowhere we don't have loads of software we could go keep check again on it was literally what we had printed and remembering it and the second part of the difference is is in post production and editing is having a cohesive story and what and the the biggest thing I have heard other people talk about before and you realize it's really true is there's three parts of writing so you've got writing the script and then you've got a story then you actually start filming and you start realizing that some things maybe aren't working or this location doesn't work here or we do so you change bits of the story as you're filming and then you really do that in editing because you cut out scenes so sometimes if you cut out a scene which kind of explained a lot we need to insert some uh, ADR lines where somebody turns their head and explains like, oh that's the thing over there or um, so like we were originally going to have lots of, you know, when um, Chris is watching Billy, his, his mate, talk through what happened, we were going to have lots of like found footage stuff in there. But it just come to the point where we were overcomplicating it and it's more just more watching of screens, which we just tried to do as we had to do, but we had to do as little as possible. Um, uh, but so it's kind of, three parts to the story where you refine it, you know? So it's like, I've got a script, but you're happy with things are going to change. So if you're a filmmaker who's kind of expecting the script is going to be made beginning to end, it's very different. I'd actually find it very interesting now for somebody else who wasn't part of the project to read the initial, watch the film and then read the initial script and kind of see kind of how different it is. But I don't, but that's not a rare thing. I don't think with any film. So um, it was just fascinating to find out these things that people say, which kind of makes sense, is actually spot on. And that was the biggest thing because short films and all that, it's just you can kind of get away with a lot more, but you need to have a really beginning, middle and end in a feature film, if that makes sense. 
Oh yeah, definitely. Like a short film just feels like a, a feature film. Sorry, feels like just multiple short films just yeah. stitched together. Yeah, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Um, moving on to my final question: What's next for David A. Roberts? Okay, so I know were... you've just wrapped up on this film, but <laughs> just... no, it's actually that's the thing. It's actually um, with all the gods being out, and it's been doing surprisingly well. Not surprisingly well. Should we just it's doing, it's doing, give yourself some more credit, doing, there, David? <laughs> yeah, it's doing well. It's doing better than expected. Then that's the that's the that's the rather than um, surprisingly well. Yeah. So the first thing that everybody wants to get going again, even though you kind of there's a strange thing with films being made. There's never an end to it because it's always kind of even when you finish editing, then you're like, oh god, we got to release it and then try and promote it and then. So it never ends. So, so because we were always waiting for a big party at the end, but we're like, yeah, you're never going to see it. It's, it's just gone forever. Um, so uh, the next coming up is kind of two things. The beauty of it perform overperforming, should we say, is that we now have less reliance on other, other people. Do you know where originally we found to find more investment or studios and... So the trick now is we can go move into a slate of films rather than one. So right now we're working on a slate of three films over a couple of years um, where one will be, I have to say three films, one, one will be in uh, pre-production, one will be in filming and one will be in post. So not all filmed at the same time. But one should be um, Patriarch. We're just not sure which of the three it will be, which Patriarch was kind of a dark thriller uh, sci-fi horror thriller um, which you can, if you go if you follow Wagyu films and you look on our profiles you'll see lots of actual behind the scenes and preparing for it which is our own. so we're going to get round to that again which will be interesting um, but the other thing is so you have one like that which is a bit bigger budget and then you have another one in the plan which would be smaller ones so we're trying to decide which one that will be but it's exciting to know that we're now at the point once you, uh, a real, real bit of advice to filmmakers again is once you get your first film out, a lot of doors open because nobody wants to work with that debut filmmaker, and we found a lot of doors closed. Um, so that's what a big part of us just going, oh, sod it, let's just do it ourselves. And as soon as you do that, everybody's kind of interested to talk to you, you know, because you've proved you can do it. Um, so it's going to be interesting looking through some of those doors, to be honest. So. Um, uh, it's now looking at the slate of a few films over a few years. Um, but Patriarch, the dark sci-fi thriller, would definitely be one of them. I'm really looking forward to that. Yeah, well, I am too, based on how much I, I adored Older Gods. Awesome. Uh, so I'm excited for whatever the future of Ragu films and yourself uh, have oh, I appreciate that. in the future. Yeah, no, thank you so much. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me today, David. No worries. Uh, a fantastic time, fantastic conversation. Um, I hope you have a fantastic rest of the day and I hope we can talk together uh, soon and on the next project. Oh, definitely. Yeah, I'll be in touch next time. Once the next one's out, we can we can chat about that one too. <laughs> oh, definitely. Well, I'm looking forward to it. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me and I'll I'll see you later. Cheers, Alec. Take care, mate.